Hello. Mr. Andrew, give some welcome, sir. Welcome, welcome. And uh, uh, today, our main, our focus of the webinar is the bioventilation because ventilation is the life of your chicken, your poultry house as well. So yes. let me introduce Mr. Andrew Gibson. Uh, he's specialist in poultry, and he has been working from 30 years in this poultry. Welcome and good evening, Mr. Andrew Gibson. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Mr. Andrew, uh, uh, I also introduced uh, regarding your job, your working. Uh, let, let us know that what you did and how you connect in this field, sir? Okay. Well, I, I started my career 30 years ago uh, on, on a farm in operation, a broader breeder farm. I've, I've worked in the industry ever since. Um, had some time spent in Asia, working in Asia in an integrated business, fully integrated meat operation. Uh, I've worked various different roles through pullet rearing, breeding, broilers, hatcheries. Um, my last, before my setting up my own business, um, I was the production director at PD Hook Hatcheries, uh, which is the largest broiler chip producer in the UK, producing around 10 million broiler chips per week. So that was my last role uh, with responsibility for four hatcheries producing 5 million chips a week and the farming base that supplied into those. Um, I've had extensive experience across capital projects, whether that's building new farms, refurbishing farms, building hatcheries, extending hatcheries, and, and significant technical input as well into the performance. Um, and I set up my own business last year uh, to offer my services to the industry globally and to utilize my knowledge and experience to help, to help businesses basically and, and people get better performance. So, so yeah, so I, I extensive experience across the full range of meat production, basically. Okay, okay, sir. And uh, where you did the job before? Before you told me that uh, you did a job in uh, different companies, uh, specifically on uh, uh, poultry farms, on uh, the systems, and uh, hatcheries. Uh, let us know, sir, please. Well, I, I've worked. I've worked in several different companies in the UK um, through my career. I also had two years. Two years working in Thailand uh, with a business in Thailand, um, particularly on the agricultural side. So that was again rearing, breeding, hatcheries, and broiler production, um, and also extensive links with retail customers from a point of view of quality assurance etc but um and then i've i've had other 
experiences going to different countries since starting my new um, my new role last year. That's great. That's great. Uh, today, uh, in our webinar, you let us know the what is the relationship uh, between temperature and humidity, and how we decrease temperature and humidity, especially in hot and humid weather. The yes. third question is that, uh, how we decrease humidity in winter? So this is a very uh, big problem, uh, especially in conventional shed, uh, where the nature ventilation uh, has been occurring. So, and also the, uh, the humidity in, in winter ventilation, that is also, uh, the high humidity is also our problem. Uh, what we do that uh, in winter we just uh, uh, start the heater and then we will reduce the humidity in our house. And in, in summer, what we do that we install the air deflectors and uh, also we uh, uh, put the pads on the timer base and uh, also uh, we can uh, uh, make we can add a, a dry liter, so that we are practicing. But uh, you let us know in your presentation uh, the relationship between humidity and temperature. And you know that in Pakistan, here is a subtropical zone. So here yes. the fluctuation of the weather is very high. You don't know that what's the weather after two, three hours. So it's changed. Uh, it's change, change, change. So, so that's why we are asking you that, that we are focusing on that problem that people have a lot of problems, especially high humidity and high temperature in the house. So please start your presentation and let us know, sir. Okay. It's saying I'm not allowed to share. Uh, just, uh, Mr. Andrew, uh, let me ask again our my question that uh, uh, we we want that you let us know that uh, in uh, summer we have a lot of problems, especially in hot and humid weather. We have a lot of humidity in the house, more than 95 percent, and temperature is more than 30, 31 degrees and Celsius. So please focus on that. And what we do, what we do, uh, uh, we install the air reflectors in the house and we install uh, the new, we, we put the new uh, litter, we add a new litter because it is also wet and also we uh, start our cooling pad management at that time. So uh, we will manage like this. And in winter, we also please focus on winter because there, this is a high humidity High humidity is also a big problem uh, in our uh, uh, winter. So please, uh, you start your presentation. Let us know that. And please, uh, I will I will tell you the host and all other people. Please unmute. Please mute their mic. Please. Thank you very much. Please, Mr. Andrew. Yes, sir. Yeah. One minute. Okay, Mr. Andrew, please start, sir. Start your presentation and let us know that how we manage that problem, especially in Pakistan, uh, hot and humid weather, the humidity and the temperature. The relationship of the humidity and the temperature, that's our question. We got a lot of questions, but now we just give you three, four questions. You please start your presentation, sir. Thank you very much. Okay, is it? I'm having trouble sharing. Um, can you see the presentation now? Uh, not, not yet, sir. It won't let me share. Here we go. Share.
Do you see that now? Yes, yes, sir, yes, yes, yes. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, so I was obviously asked to put together um, some a presentation on tunnel ventilation and evaporative cooling. And these are just some of my thoughts and my experiences from working with these type of houses. And your comment about high humidity and hot temperatures was very similar to what Thailand would be in certain times of the year as well. So it's quite interesting. So this is information I've used for a number of years, information that has come from uh, breed companies, University of Georgia, etc., on air speeds. And I've just put a selection there for pullets, rearing birds, breeders, and, and broilers. And, and obviously with the stocking density of rearing birds uh, and breeders, you don't need the air speed that you need for broilers. So there's just a, a range of air speeds there that people would tend to use. Uh, minimum tunnel fan capacity. Um, again, this is information that's freely available. Uh, and the reason for this is to ensure as even a temperature down the tunnel house as possible. And if you run with those as a minimum, you should achieve less than three degrees difference from cool pad to fans. Um, although that may not be enough air speed or ca fan capacity to cool the birds in the hot weather. Um, starting temperature um, around three degrees above the set points, whatever your aim for the set point is. Uh, and again, taking note of the, the wind chill effect on the birds and the type of birds they are. Um, what's the result of poor tunnel ventilation? There's just a diagram there that shows the cool pad end um, cooler than the fan end. Um, excessive temperature variation across, down the length of the house uh, creates multiple environments for the birds. Uh, if you're using migration fences, obviously birds are growing in different conditions and poor, performance, a poor environment leads to poor bird performance. House or whether there's leakage at the side of the house, etc. poor insulation. So again, it's, it's a real area to focus on in terms of getting that right. Um, measuring airspeed, obviously airspeed is critical uh, in hot and humid environments. Uh, there's just some guidance there to measuring airspeeds to try and get as close an average as possible. Um, if you measure in the center of the house, you'll always get a higher reading. Um, it's worthwhile using an average feature on an anemometer um, and take an average measurement for at least a minute. Uh, and that picture there is just an example of a meter that is widely used in the poultry industry. A uh, very good meter also measures humidity, etc., as well as airspeed. So quite, quite a useful tool for the broiler farms particularly. Uh, this is some data from the uh, Auburn University, again, um, just showing um, the differences of measuring airspeed in a house and actually getting it, how it would compare to the design airspeed of the house. Um, again, showing one point in the middle, you'll get a higher figure than what you, you're designed for. Um, tunnel airflow capacity. Um, so I think the key first is to decide on how much airspeed you want, uh, whether that's to do with the type of bird or whether it's to do with the climatic conditions that the house has been operated in. We calculate the cross-sectional area of the house and then the capacity is that airspeed times the um, cross-sectional area, which will then give you the required capacity for your fans um, to, to maintain that airspeed, um, whether that be cubic meters per second or cubic feet per minute. Uh, I just put this graph in, this is courtesy of another university, um, but it just shows uh, the effect of wind chill at different air speeds depending on the age of the bird. So obviously four week old broilers, not as well feathered, uh, they will have a bigger effect of that wind chill uh, as the air speed increases. I apologise that's in Fahrenheit and feet per minute, it's just, um, it's just where the slide was produced. But yeah, just, just showing the, the differences between uh, age of bird and how they're affected by the airspeed. Criteria for selecting fans, uh, there's a, a, lab, a laboratory in the US, Best Labs, uh, they test all new tunnel ventilation fans and produce uh, annual information on the ratings of those, fa those fans at various pressures. Um, one thing, particularly in climates where the fans are going to be running a lot, is to look at the energy factor. Um, how efficient the fans are in terms of how much air they move per unit of electricity. Um, and there's just a couple of guidelines there. The minimum really is 19 uh, CFM per watt. 
Uh, a good one would be 20.8 and an ideal is 22 or higher and, and fans are getting more and more efficient as they move to belt dri away from belt driven fans to direct drive fans again all about being more efficient um, the airflow ratio again this, all this information is on that website uh, in the best labs um, fan manual so the airflow ratio is an indicator of how well the fan performs under pressure when it moves from 12 and a half pascals to 50 pascals Again, you want that fan to stand up to that higher pressure and still move the volume of air you expect. Cone fans are, tend to be better in terms of performance and efficiency. And it's not always, in my experience, best to purchase on price a fan. It's sometimes worth paying a little bit extra for a better fan um, to get the airflow right. Um, just a couple of fans there. That's um, a hired hand cone fan, the big Dutchman box fan. And you can just see the difference there as the um, static pressure increases, that's in inches of water. As the static in pressure increases, how those fans are affected and how their performance drops off with the box fan dropping off twice as much as the um, cone fan. And, and there's lots of different fans out there. And I, I wouldn't say which one's best or which one. It's just looking at the information and making it here based on the information. Again, just a note on static pressure. Um, this is just to understand how uh, the static pressure builds up in the house. So I brought in the pad area to only have that pressure and coming through the pad. You then, if you have a tunnel inlet door, uh, obviously that will increase the pressure again. The air down the length of the house um, and that that's with light traps on the fans. Assume no light traps on the um, tunnel, uh, the pad and the tunnel door. Um, so yeah, the, the difference there is it's running at a slightly lower design speed with it being a rearing house. Uh, but the light traps are adding significantly to the um, um, pressure, the static pressure in the house. And you can see there that's that's now 55 pascals um, for the length of that for the rearing house. Again, very important then to select the fans correctly to make sure you've still got the capacity um, and the fans are working efficiently. Uh, Mr. Andrew, please let, let allow, uh, excuse me, sir. Um, yes. Sir, excuse me, excuse me, sir. Uh, please allow to. Can you, can you hear me, sir? Actually, you. Well, to aim to maintain the house temperature below 28 degrees, uh, it, it will require a 75% efficient pad. The 70s won't be right. I mentioned before the pad pressure should not exceed 12 and a half pascals, um, 0.05 inches of water pressure. Um, and that's, that's basically telling you what area of pad you need with a given fans. Uh, and again, look for that velocity coming off the pads as well. Um, so the pad area is the total tunnel fan capacity divided by the desi desired airspeed at the, press, the, the design pressure. Pad, getting the size of the pads correctly is very important in houses. Cooling pad operation, and this is where your comment earlier comes into when you should run them and when um, you shouldn't. Um, it is important that all fans are on before the cool pads um, start to be used. So you've got maximum airspeed first before you start to use the cool pads. Um, pads should not be used unless the temperature is above 28 degrees. And that helps keep the humidity overall, the levels in the house lower. Um, and as a, as a comment there, house humidity should not exceed um, 85 to 90%. Fogging nozzles if used, um, shouldn't be shouldn't be turned on if the humidity is above 75 percent it will push the humidity too high and again there's a comment there. um, yeah there's just comment there when to set the set point for foggers coming on if you do have them um only use pads between 9 a.m and 6 p.m Night time yeah. operation will increase the heat stress of the room, the humidity will be too high, and I'll come on to a slide on the relationship between temperature and humidity. Um, cool pads coming on should not shut off fans. We still need to maintain that airflow um, 
in the house and that airspeed in the house to help the drying capacity of the air as it moves across the litter. Um, so you don't want the, to reduce the airspeed when the cool pads are running. And again, that comes down to the control has been set properly, again, depending on the type of control, how it works and what, what temperature has been used to drive the, the cooling and the, um, and the fans. And again, another key one is always maintain airspeed at night, especially for larger birds, to allow the birds to cool down. It can take two to three hours after the temperatures drop for those birds to get back to a comfortable temperature overnight. Um, so it is worth maintaining that airspeed at night um, to get those birds cooler and also to maintain that air drying properties of the air as well, the litter drying, sorry. Um, not to 14 days, um, cooling pad operation needs to be limited to the use of a timer. Um, you're only really just trying to take the edge off the air. Uh, why are you doing this? You don't want to push the humidity up too much in the house early on and create more humidity in, um, into the litter. Um, so operate the pads on an interval timer. And again, this is just one that I've seen work 10 seconds on, 10 minutes off. Um, to result in an incoming air temperature between 29 and 31. Um, limiting this cooling in the first two weeks will keep that house humidity lower and it'll be easy to manage the litter. So I said I'd come on to a graph that shows the relationship between humidity and temperature. This is obviously tracking over uh, just over a week's period. Uh, it doesn't matter where the area is, but as you can see, as temperature rises, humidity comes down. So the hottest part of the day, you will have the lowest humidity in the day. Um, likewise, the coolest part of the day will be the, the highest humidity. And that relationship stands wherever you are in the world, basically. And um, that's the relationship between those. And, and what I did here, this is a presentation I saw, but this just gives an example. This is actually weather data from Lahore, I think in 2016 from memory. Um, but if you see the examples where the hours are pointing, so if, if, if there was a, a day that was 35 degrees, with 65% humidity, um, which is the top out line across, with the 4.4 degree drop in temperature, times by the 65% humidity, your, your RH going into the house would be 84.8. .8. And I've just taken a couple of examples there, um, which shows the uh, calculation uh, based on uh, two at 35, two at 38 degrees. The area that's colored red there is the area where you're starting to get into the danger zone um, in terms of combination of temperature and humidity. Um, where then you really need the airspeed to be working to help dissipate the heat from the chickens. Um, cooling pad water, um, block cool cells, um, push up the static pressure and restrict airflow. And the key to remember is that as water evaporates behind and as the water is evaporated, that, that concentration increases, which will cause buildup scale debris on the pads, which will interfere with the airflow, restricting the airflow and increase the static pressure in the house. Recommendation, and I think this is quite common practice, will be to flush the water system out once a week, uh, particularly when uh, there's obviously a high usage of, um, of the pads, uh, to clean those pads. Um, again, it depends on water quality. If the water is very good quality, you might get away with flushing less, but my experience is once a week is, is good practice. So I think um, in terms of, um, but, um, I don't know if anybody, is there any questions? So would you like me to comment on anything else?
Sorry, I can't, I can't hear. My, yes. Thank you, Mr. Andrew Gibson, for this great time and this great presentation. And I have a lot of questions because I got a lot of questions uh, from the Pakistan farmers, the entrepreneurs, and the veterinary doctors. Uh, but please uh, let us share again. You just uh, brief by your words that. Uh, the temperature and humidity problem, especially in hot and humid weather, and in winter, the humidity problem in the winter. Please uh, let us share again, sir. Thank you very much. Just brief with your words, sir. You see, yeah, I think I think the key the key in those conditions is air speed. You can heat the air because obviously hotter air is able to carry more moisture so that will then reduce the relative humidity um, but my, my experience is, is it's all about getting the right air over the, over the litter so where you have higher stocking densities as well but it's, it's airflow and the correct airflow and maintaining the humidity when you can is the key so that's why, especially in the first two weeks, you can end up with a lot of moisture already in the litter in the first two weeks of the bird's life before the litter has started working and actually generating any heat itself. Obviously, as it starts to break down uh, through the composting process, it will generate heat and, and help dry. Uh, but that doesn't happen in the first two weeks. Right, right. And uh, what we do in our winter when the humidity is uh, too much high in winter, and especially I am telling about the open houses, the non-environmental control houses. I am telling about that, the natural ventilated okay. houses, what they do. Well, I think you, you've got the heating option there, haven't you, to heat the air so the humidity, so the, humidity the relative humidity goes down. Um, but it, would they have circulation fans in? Circulation fans could be quite good as well to circulate the air and again, just to create some drying effect. Uh, okay, Mr. Andrew, thank you very much. Uh, in uh, Pakistan, uh, Maghrib prayer time. So thank you, sir. Thank you. Have a good time, sir. And inshallah, we will. You are in our group, sir. And the next time, we will uh, again uh, discuss on the latest environmental control ventilation systems. We will discuss on you with you, uh, inshallah. Next time, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. So great, sir. No, no, no. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Um,